Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Caroline Berger, Director of Corporate and Community Relations for the University of Arizona Health Sciences in Phoenix. I'd like to introduce you to our amazing team, led by Allison O2 and Anne-Marie Medina, our Director in Tucson. We'd like to welcome you today to today's presentation, and we're happy that you're here to join us for this noontime expert chat. But first, I'd like to take a few minutes and introduce you to the University of Health Sciences. Welcome to the University of Arizona Health Sciences. As the statewide leader in biomedical research and health professions training, health sciences includes College of Medicine Tucson, College of Medicine Phoenix, College of Nursing, College of Pharmacy, and the Melanina Zuckerman College of Public Health. Together, they provide cutting edge health education, breakthrough research, and a diverse offering of community outreach services. At the heart of health sciences, our employees, nearly 5,000 along with 4,000 students, makes us one of the top employers in the state. Our growing research and education programs are offered on two campuses, one at the main campus in Tucson and the other in the heart of downtown Phoenix on the biomedical campus. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is a major contributor to U Arizona's well-earned reputation as one of the country's top research institutions. And each year, we receive more than $200 million in research grants and contracts, providing vital funding to help address some of our most critical healthcare challenges. We are grateful for this support, which is fueling discoveries and treatments in areas including cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and now COVID-19. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is also in a unique position to affect change in a rapidly shifting healthcare landscape. As part of our strategic plan, we have developed a set of initiatives to reshape the future of healthcare. We are focusing our efforts on five important areas. Next generation education, precision healthcare for all, making wellness ageless, creating defenses against disease, and new frontiers for better health. Through these strategic initiatives, we have unprecedented opportunities to excel in education and research in more and better ways than ever before. And we invite you to join us on this journey. Please know that our dedicated corporate and community relations team is here to be your connector with health sciences. Thank you for your dedication and for all that you do to make our communities healthy. So you can imagine there's a lot happening in health sciences. So we urge you to join us for more information and visit us at uahs.arizona.edu and be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms. And I invite you to follow me on Twitter at CE Burger and make sure you tag your posts with hashtag Wellness Wednesdays AZ. So for today's session, we want you to be interactive and engaged with us. We know this is an important topic and there's lots of information out there. So please leave a question in the chat function. Um, Dr. Shab will do a brief presentation, then we'll leave time to be able to address all your questions and things. So please feel free. We want you to um, send us your questions and any feedback that you may have. After today's session, you will get a post-session email filled with lots of good things, including a very brief survey we ask you to take. It's important for us to hear your ideas and see how we're doing and if we're meeting your needs. You'll also receive all the links and resources that are talked about today in addition to a link to a recording of today's session, which will also be posted on YouTube. We invite you to share this with your family and friends. Plus, you'll also have access to all the past Wellness Wednesday sessions that we've had. So if you wanna go back and review or share those as well, please feel free to do so. So now it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce one of our most esteemed presenters that we've had the honor of having here on Wellness Wednesday. He actually kicked off our series last April and has been back several times by popular demand. And today is going to be talking about a very important topic, heart disease. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah is a physician and medical educator who is actively working to create innovative solutions for chronic diseases of our time. He is the Director of Public Health Prevention and Health Promotion and Associate Professor 
of Family, Community, and Preventive Medicine at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix, and a professor of public health at the Mel and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health. He has undertaken research, published, published articles, and medical textbook chapters on disease prevention, nutrition, health promotion, wellness, and complementary and alternative medicine. And in his spare time, he is currently writing his first full-length book on health and wellness. So we are very pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Shah. Thank you very much, Caroline. <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here as part of the Wellness Wednesdays. I think a wonderful community has been created uh, with this uh, seminar series, getting experts to share their knowledge uh, and empower the community. So I hope that continues to grow and it's uh, needed now more than ever uh, with the pandemic that we found ourselves in. And hopefully uh, we'll be getting out of that at some point in the next year. So we'll see how things go. So um, getting to our topic for today, um, also just pointing out, you can learn more about me and connect with me through my website, as well as on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, so we're going to talk about heart disease and, and February is Heart Health Month. So it's very important to talk about it. And one of the main reasons when we look at the statistics is the fact that 80 million Americans have a heart disease and one out of every 2.8 Americans. So basically you can break this down further as 2000 folks dying every day uh, and one death every 37 seconds. And it's really the number one cause of death. And so this is, this is why we have a whole month dedicated to heart health uh, so that we can do what we can to take out this number one killer. Um, I just wanna show a few maps which basically shows the distribution of where heart disease happens. So we like to start with epidemiology, kind of say, where does it look like? And this is kind of the, the, the um, breakdown around the country. What I want you to notice is the fact that, just kind of keep this map in your head for a second. And then we're gonna look at maps for obesity and diabetes. So let's look at obesity. You can also see some of the same areas which were higher death rates from cardiovascular disease are also uh, higher rates of obesity. And we're also gonna see the same trend with diabetes. And if I, um, you know, earlier maps also when we first had the pandemic and we looked at also, and I think some of the data here as well with COVID-19, you also see deaths higher in these regions as well because of the risk that these, um, these diseases actually place in terms of uh, susceptibility to hospitalization illness for COVID-19. So many reasons to think about heart disease and then just looking at these other uh, medical conditions, which by the way, are also risk factors for heart disease. Um, one of the things to point out, which is really important is that um, heart disease is actually the leading cause of death in women uh, more than breast cancer, which may be counterintuitive people. There's a lot of attention around breast cancer and it's important to think about that and focus on that. But recognizing the fact that um, you know heart disease and heart attack and stroke uh, symptoms, particularly heart attack symptoms, uh, present atypically in women, not the typical kind of chest pain, shortness of breath. And so being aware that this, is, this exists and promoting that, the whole uh, American Heart Association, Go Red for Women. I know that um, the University of Arizona participates in this and is very active in supporting it. So this is another thing I just want to raise awareness of if you didn't know already. Um, so one way to start this discussion that we're going to have right now for a few minutes together, because there's so much to talk about, is really looking at risk factors for heart disease, okay? And um, this is actually out of a slide that I give to the medical students when we talk about um, preventing and treating heart disease. And we look at the modifiable risk factors and we look at the non-modifiable risk factors. And I think this is important because so much in terms of the risk for heart attack and stroke uh, and heart disease basically comes is modifiable. It's something that you, it actually links directly to lifestyle and factors that we can actually change that we have control over. And I think that is really important. That's kind of what we're gonna focus on uh, for this discussion today. It is important to recognize and know your risk in terms of these other factors, which are non-modifiable. Um, so risk increases with age. Um, this is kind of the breakdown in terms of women versus men. Um, also risk if you have a premature uh, family history of heart disease. So in a first degree relative, like uh, a mother, father, brother, sister. Um, 
and you can see the age breakdown there. And then also um, your race ethnicity also is, uh, is a risk factor. I would argue that because of the impact that systemic structural racism has here in social determinants of health, that this is actually something that is modifiable. And it is something that's very really important to address as, you know, for example, in our black communities, 33% higher than the overall population um, in terms of heart disease. And so, um, you know, this is something that I think we can, it's a whole other topic that is really important to think about as well uh, in terms of what we can do to change things for the better. Um, now, focusing in on the modifiable risk factors that we all uh, can have and we can all change for heart disease, really it's smoking, um, high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol levels, and we're going to talk specifically the breakdown of that is low HDL, which is the protective good cholesterol, high total cholesterol, high LDL, which is also known as the bad uh, uh, cholesterol, although there's further nuances there too, but we may not get into all those details, and then high triglycerides. Obesity and diabetes, as I mentioned, and then also sedentary lifestyle, poor fitness, poor diet, and I would also add to that list probably stress, um, and uh, inflammation, which basically a lot of these things increase chronic inflammation. Now, short-term inflammation uh, is really necessary. You have a cut or bruise, the body in, you know, sends all their immune cells there to, to treat it, to stop it, and that's fine, and that's good, and it's important, it's natural, and it's healthy. But long-term inflammation uh, from chronic stress, uh, like microaggressions from the impact of racism, um, or high blood pressure, which is putting stress on your arteries. Uh, and we'll talk more about the role of cholesterol or even a high sugar diet. So all these things <clears throat> can increase inflammation over time. So let's look at hypertension to begin with as one of these factors that we can um, modify. Um, the most well-studied approach to this is actually uh, in terms of diet is the DASH diet, which many of you may have already heard about. And the key part of this diet is really the fact that it's much higher in fiber coming from plant-based sources with basically is fruits and vegetables, and that can include nuts and seeds, uh, and lower in salt or sodium. And so this has been shown to be as effective uh, as blood pressure medications in terms of lowering blood pressure. And there's plenty of great um, literature out, out and on the web about the DASH diet. When it comes to high blood pressure, the other real medicine is using exercise as medicine. And exercise, particularly aerobic exercise that gets your heart rate up is really important for uh, cardiovascular fitness. And more recently, we've learned about high intensity interval training or HIT, uh, which really doesn't have to be for athletes only. In fact, there's been studies done right here in the Valley uh, where they've looked at heart failure patients doing HIT. So remember, it's just about getting your heart rate up for a few minutes and then lowering it for a few minutes. So for example, running uh, or walking quickly on a treadmill and then walking slowly for a few minutes, so three minutes, two minutes, for example, on and off. And that yo-yo of up and down in terms of the stress that it actually does on your heart actually is, is so, um, it, it's healing. And, and in fact, there's one of the studies that I had mentioned here that's done locally, they found people with heart failure, so staged one, two, or three heart failure, after a month of doing that three times a week for 30 minutes, they went down a stage in reverse. So those who were stage three went down to stage two, stage two went to stage one, and then some folks in stage one went to not having heart failure according to the criteria. So that can really happen at any point. And that's something where you can think about exercise and there's a whole conversation we can have an exercise. Exercise has also been shown to be effective for treating uh, mild uh, to moderate depression. It's first line um, uh, treatment therapy actually in the UK uh, for depression as a, as a prescription. Um, another thing for high blood pressure is meditation and meditative practices, breathing techniques, breathing practices have also been shown to reduce stress levels, reduce cortisol and reduce blood pressure. Um, mind body therapies like yoga and Tai Chi also have been studied and shown to reduce blood pressure. So talking about some of the other modifiable risk factors, Cholesterol is one of the big ones. Obesity, diabetes, again, we could you know, come back and do another wellness Wednesday about optimal well, uh, health and in terms of weight. And also we can talk about diabetes because there's a lot of great things to talk about. Um, but also, as I mentioned, physical inactivity and these are some of the other factors. So let's look at some of the research that was done. So the Nurses Health Study, which was done over 20 years involving 80,000 women, showed 82% reduction of the risk for heart disease. 
And these were the main factors that they found among the women who had that reduced risk, that 82% reduction, no smoking, daily physical activity of at least 30 minutes, which was, could be limited to just walking, um, not being overweight, um, limiting alcohol intake, and then having a higher omega-3 fatty acids and fiber in the diet and low trans fat and glycemic load, in other words, sugar in the diet and high good fats from polyunsaturated fats. So these are some things we found in that research. Now, other research has shown the role of food as medicine, which I've talked about a number of times, um, that a whopping 45.4% of cardiometabolic deaths are really due to suboptimal intake of real good food. And specifically they found excess sodium to be a factor and insufficient intake of nuts and seeds. Uh, if you don't take away anything else, adding raw nuts and seeds to your diet uh, can have a huge impact on heart health by providing those healthy fats. Um, and then obviously avoiding processed meats and also healthy uh, cold water fish. This is another thing that was kind of connected with that too, which again is another source of healthy fats. Um, speaking to our food system, you know, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but basically our food policy is really at odds with, with health and we incentivize unhealthy food uh, to be, you know, or food like substances or Franken foods, as I like to call them to be widely available. Um, and that's part of where we get to the standard American diet where over 64% is really processed foods, small percentage being plant foods. Really, you want this to be plant, maybe this to be animal, right? And then this to be processed, that would be a better uh, breakdown of that pie chart. But what does the standard American diet, which is sad, look like? It's high in bad fats, uh, high in omega-6 fatty acids, high in high sugar, refined sugar, refined carbs, high in additives, artificial flavorings, all sorts of chemicals, uh, and things actually that are added to the food that are not necessarily good for health, um, that might improve shelf life. It's low in the good healthy fats, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. It's low in plant foods, and it's low in protective micronutrients that come from these real foods. So the standard American diet with all these components to it has been linked to diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Again, remember the, the maps that we started out with, those things are really, there's a lot of areas of overlap with that and metabolic syndrome. Research has shown the Mediterranean diet to really be kind of the antidote for heart disease and also just shown other benefits having antidepressant effects, um, anti-inflammatory for sure. And it's basically mostly vegetables, fruit, whole grains. Uh, if you have fish, wild seafood, less carbs, um, less red meat. And, and um, the research has shown they first did this when the American Heart Association uh, for many years was promoting a low fat diet. And uh, the LION study basically found that there was a 73% risk reduction by adding back these healthy fats, so much so that they had to stop the study and say, look, low fat uh, diet without these healthy fats is not so good. And we need to actually you know, stop this research because of the impact at 73% risk reduction. Just to give you an idea of impact, one of the statin studies showed a 30 to 35% decrease, okay, in some of the same cardiac endpoints versus a 73% risk reduction for this uh, particular Mediterranean diet. So the, don't underestimate the impact of diet in terms of heart disease. And that shift I mentioned, you know, we came from a place where fat was demonized, but now about healthy heart is, is a, it's a question of not about avoiding all fat, but actually having good fat as opposed to bad fat. And there's been other studies that PrediMed is another one you can look up, which talks about this and it really pulled out the impact that, um, that uh, the Mediterranean diet has on damaging LDL, which sets off the process of atherosclerosis. And I'm gonna show you an image of that here in a second. Um, and, um, and really pointed to the, the, the impact of extra virgin olive oil. Um, and, and, and we'll talk more about that. But basically what happens, and this is kind of a illustration that shows this, this plaque formation, is LDL basically gets damaged, right? And when LDL is oxidized and damaged, that releases these phospholipids and that causes an inflammatory response. And that's what leads to the process of atherosclerosis, which you know, is, is really the, the fundamental um, uh, process of heart disease. Um, some things, some study research in, in the Mediterranean diet has been a big one that studied. Another one is the Dean Ornish uh, Heart Disease Reversal Program, uh, which has also been shown to actually, uh, they, they've looked at the arteries and they've found this kind of going in reverse, this process with that, so total reversal. It's plant-based diet. So this is a plant-based diet. Um, 
sometimes people say it's lower in fat. There's also parts of sometimes you've there have been the research of looking at the healthy fats from fats from sorry from plants. Um, there's also physical activity. There's also stress management, and there's also psychological encouragement through support groups. So it's a multifaceted approach. It's not just the diet, uh, which also points to how all those different factors are important for heart disease reversal. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I want to get to the summary page. When you think about the different types of fat, what's the good and what's the bad? Monounsaturated fat, which are found in olives, nuts, avocados, these MUFA, okay, high MUFA diets, you find lower heart disease rates. So it lowers LDL and it raises the good cholesterol of HDL. Polyunsaturated fat lowers LDL, raises HDL. So that's also good. Specifically, one type of that is omega-3, which lowers triglyceride levels. Uh, saturated fat is actually a double-edged sword um, because on the one hand, it raises uh, LDL, but it also raises HDL. And particularly if you get it from grass-fed sources, you're going to have um, more um, healthy fats in there, which actually may be beneficial for heart health. And trans fat is something you want to avoid completely. Um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of olive oil uh, and trans fat you want to avoid. Another just pointer to point out, Whenever fat gets damaged, it, it gets oxidized. And this damage, which happens with fat that's in processed foods like the hydrogenated oils, or when you burn it to the point of the smoke point, that is also can go into your system and also damage the LDL and begin that process of atherosclerosis. So even if you have the highest quality extra virgin olive oil, you're burning it, getting it to the smoke point, you're making an unhealthy food. So that's something else to keep in mind. And fiber is also a key thing when it comes to to heart disease and heart health that we should also keep in mind. A few other things just to kind of throw in there, getting adequate sleep is really important. Um, some studies have shown that it not only impacts blood pressure, but even just an even extra hour here and there can actually link to not only heart disease, but other cancer, some cancers and diabetes. Um, and then I can't emphasize enough the impact of psychosocial stress. This particular interheart study, interheart study showed that psychosocial stress was responsible for a whopping 32% of risk for uh, heart attacks and strokes, which was equal to diabetes, 30% smoking, 30% hypertension. Each of those physical risk factors were the same as like mental health. And in fact, we find that people with depression uh, and that's untreated after a heart attack or stroke are three times more likely to have, uh, it doubles the risk, um, they're, they're three times more li likely to have depression. And then you have a twice, two times higher risk of having another heart attack or stroke if you don't treat that depression. So mental health is really important. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there just in the interest of time. We don't have that much time, but we wanna to get to some of the highlights and I wanna be able to interact and answer your questions. Yes, thank you, great information. We do have some questions coming in. I've heard that canola oil is very inflammatory. Is this something to avoid? Yeah, I think the research is still out on that, but I think it makes sense when you look at it physiologically because one of the issues with uh, canola oil, a lot of it's mass produced uh, using hexane and high temperatures and high pressure to produce it, which also damages the oil in the process. And the fact that a lot of our processed foods have higher amounts of omega-6 uh, and um, in, in the which is a which is what canola oil is also high in. We already get a lot of that in the processed foods that we eat also because of the use of vegetable oils. So I would actually say the emerging evidence is probably trying to use other oils like extra virgin olive oil, not getting it past the smoke point. If you're gonna do something for high heat cooking, you wanna do like expeller press, you know, at lower temperatures like walnut oil, um, uh, grapeseed oil or uh, avocado oil, which are have high smoke points and don't have some of the potential downside of canola oil. Very good. Can too much protein be hard on heart health? For example, those that increase protein intake to build muscle through exercise while losing fat. I think too much of any of the main macronutrients can be damaging to the, to the body. We need to have an optimal kind of balance. One way to look at that is, for example, the standard American diet is really high in processed foods, which is really high in refined grains and sugars without the fiber that's naturally occurring in whole fruits. Uh, and so you see a huge impact on diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Uh, excess protein really directly impacts kidneys more than anything else. So if you have chronic kidney disease, that's something to watch for. But then also, what is your source of protein? Uh, is it plant-based protein? Is it 
Um, saturated fat, which also can have some downside for the heart, depending on where you're getting that. Uh, so I think it, it really depends. Uh, and you want to kind of not go overboard. If you're building muscle, um, that can be problematic also, depending on what kind of exercise you're doing. Um, you also want to be, be able to, you know, start low and go up slow and kind of build towards muscles. Uh, and also that, that way your heart can also adjust and, and anticipate and adapt to those changes as opposed to being a weekend warrior and just going all out too quickly. And that can also have, uh, you know, hidden heart, heart attacks basically come forward in those situations. And of course, we always want to encourage everyone to check with your physician first before you. Yeah, all this stuff I'm saying, definitely check with your physician. I'm giving some high level thoughts and advice, but you got to talk to your doctor because it varies for each person. Mm -hmm. um, what type of coconut oils are recommended? Probably like unrefined and you want to limit, you want to do too much of it again, because it is saturated fat. So it's that double-edged sword where it increases your LDL, uh, but it also increases your HDL, which is good. Um, but then I want, want to look at other, your bigger, the bigger sources of inflammation and what could damage your, your LDL, the saturated fat that comes from that. So, you know, whether you're a smoker or not, whether um, you're having a high sugar diet, which also can damage the LDL whether or not you have high blood pressure, right? All of these other factors come into play. So I think it may be something that's okay to intake, but, and again, the unrefined, uh, again, not something that's in processed foods as, as other, uh, you know, solid fats, but you got to look at the bigger picture in terms of everything else that you're doing, adding to inflammation in your, in your diet and lifestyle. Is there any impact on heart risk due to tea? Um, I think that there's antioxidants in green tea. Um, if you do too much caffeine, like caffeinated tea, um, you can have negative consequences. If you have high blood pressure, for example, or putting too much pressure on your heart, it's like a stimulant. So there's a balance there and your body kind of adapts to a certain amount of caffeine intake. So you want to avoid like the energy drinks, for example, but usually just doing tea is pretty good. And in fact, some of the decaffeinated herbal teas, like for example, hibiscus tea, uh, standardized hibiscus tea, two to three cups a day has been shown at, to be as effective as some blood pressure medications for lowering blood pressure. So you can actually have some real great benefits for heart health, depending on the type of tea that you, you choose to drink. That's great to know. Is it safe and recommended to eat a teaspoon of olive oil every day? Absolutely. Extra version, uh, again, cold uh, expeller press. So it's, you know, overly refined or at high temperatures. You can get high quality olive oil. That was the star of the Mediterranean diet. And they actually found the, the groups that had the highest intake of extra virgin olive oil, in some cases close to one liter per week, had the, the most benefit in terms of reduced inflammation and reduced risk of heart attacks and strokes. So if you can get quality extra virgin olive oil, you can use it as a finishing oil by pouring it on top of your food. Again, avoiding cooking at high temperatures with it, but adding it to your food. And it's also a great source of calories increase the percentage coming from MUFA, uh, monounsaturated fats, which are in there, and actually uh, decrease waist circumference and, and take away abdominal fat. So extra virgin olive oil, yeah, you should have actually two or three tablespoons or more uh, per day, not just one. Okay. One, one last question. Do you offer classes in Metro Phoenix? Um, I offer um, sessions through my website. You can contact me. You can get in touch. Um, individual consultations. Uh, we'll probably hopefully do more. Uh, we're developing a culinary medicine program here at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. And we are gonna be doing more education for the general public on what we're learning and what we're putting into our curriculum for our medical students. So stay tuned to that and feel free to get in touch with me through my website or social media. That's great. And we will be sure in our post event email to also include uh, Dr. Shah's uh, contact information. So thank you so much for joining us today and for keeping heart health in the forefront for all of us. So we appreciate that and all your efforts. And now we invite you to join us in two weeks, uh, February 24th for our next Wellness Wednesday, where we're gonna be talking about remaining positive and overcoming feelings of guilt and hopefully reducing some of that stress that you may have that we were just talking about. Um, we will be joined by Lourdes Rodriguez and Eileen Lawless from the University of Arizona Life and Work Connections Program. So be sure to register for that and you can check out our full Wellness Wednesday schedule. There's our URL there, but again, we'll be sure to include that link in our post-session email. So you really want to look out for that. 
Um, speaking of things to do and other offerings to help in your health and wellness journey, um, University of Arizona Health Sciences is very proud to present a new series called Aging in the Arts. This is a free live stream education series with gentle movement to help promote better health and wellness for an aging population. It's being offered now through March 2nd, every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. There is a registration and we will include that link as well. And then something fun for members of all ages of your family coming up this Saturday. Connect to STEM Live TV. Virtual sessions of fun and engaging STEM activities and resources and projects for kids and the young at heart. Our lineup for this Saturday begins at 10 a.m. with Wonders of the Heart Hear the Beat, followed by 1045. We are going to get a tour of a makerspace, the new Boys and Girls Clubs of Scottsdale makerspace. They're also going to be demonstrating drones and how they are used in the healthcare field. At 1130, we're going to talk about Artificial Intelligence and Virtual Reality Part 1. So you don't want to miss this. And we're going to be giving out a free custom edition Connect to STEM t-shirt during each live session. So please be sure to join us for that. And as always, we encourage you to stay safe, bear down, and masks up. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you in two weeks. Take care.